Hello, I'm Maria Williams with the Collaborative on Health and the Environment. Change is bringing you the latest environmental health science through our partnership calls and webinars, science serves, publications, and social media. I would like to welcome everyone to today's CHE partnership webinar, which is titled Plastic Food Packaging, State of the Science on Chemical Constituents and Health Hazards. This is the second webinar in our new series, The Effects of Plastics on Health. Our moderator today is Steve Heilig, Director of Public Health and Education at CHE and also Associate Executive Director of the San Francisco Marin Medical Society. We will leave time following the presentations for a brief Q&A session. You may type in questions through the Q&A feature available on the menu bar at the top of your window at any point during the presentations. After the presentations, our moderator will read out questions for our panelists to respond to. We will get to as many comments and questions as we can during the Q&A period. For those of you who called in on the phone, we have posted slides to accompany today's webinar on our website. You can download these by going to healthandenvironment.org. Please scroll to the bottom of the page and select today's webinar. On the webinar page is a link to the slides. Everyone on the webinar right now is muted with the exception of our moderator and our speakers. This webinar is scheduled to last for 60 minutes and is being recorded for our call and webinar archive. With that, I'll turn things over to you, Steve. Thank you very much, Maria, and good day to everybody, or good evening if you are over in Europe. Um, it's great to be uh, on this call today. I have not moderated one of, of these in some time now, although I was the uh, co-founder of CHE in 2002 and did many for the early years. And it's been very interesting to see the topics evolve over time. This one in particular, because um, if some of you may recall, you may have seen uh, the legendary film, The Graduate from the 1960s. And uh, it was the film that launched Dustin Hoffman. And as a young college graduate, he is at a party where one of his father's colleagues gives him advice for a career. And he says, I'll tell you one word, plastics. And it turns out that he was right because plastic production and use has just continued to expand exponentially around the globe. Much of the attention from the environmental perspective has been related to the pollution in the environment. Of course, the giant uh, gyre out in the ocean, the uh, use in landfills and non-recyclable uh, plastics, et cetera. More recently only, we've had much more attention coming now to the effects on human health. So that is one of the topics of the call, or the topic of the call today. And this is actually the second in a series about plastics for CHE. And you can get more information about that uh, on our website as well. So we are very pleased today to have some great speakers. And we're going to begin with Dr. Cassine Negro, who is a scientific communication officer at the Food Packaging Forum. And they have put together some new database, a lot of new information. So she's going to tell us uh, about their new project and what they are working on at this point. So please go ahead, Dr. Grohl. Um, hello, everyone, and thank you, Steve, for the nice introduction. I hope you can hear me well. Uh, before delving into chemicals and plastic food packaging, I would like to briefly introduce Food Packaging Forum, where I work. Uh, so Food Packaging Forum Foundation was founded in 2012 in Zurich, and we are a nonprofit funded by unconditional donations. We do science communication on food contact materials and chemicals, migration into food and associated health effects. And we communicate and uh, work with scientists, industry experts, regulators, communicators, NGOs, and all other interested stakeholders. And we are currently a team of dedicated five people that you can see on the bottom of this page. So just to go briefly through the key concepts in the field, for the food contact article, you can imagine a yogurt cup. And this yogurt cup is made of several food contact materials, so OFCMs, like plastic for the cup and aluminum of the lid, but also coating, adhesives, and printing inks. And each one of these materials is actually um, uh, cons uh, consisting of, uh, of its own food contact chemicals, which can be monomers, polymers, additives, pigments, or also reaction byproducts or degradation products. And uh, these chemicals, when they're present in the packaging, they can actually migrate into food. And the extent of migration uh, would depend on different factors like time of the contact, temperature, or food type. 
And what we would like to understand is whether there is a contribution of food contact chemicals to human diseases. And epidemiology has reported on the increased occurrence of different diseases, different chronic diseases in the human population, like obesity or diabetes or neurodevelopmental diseases or hormone-mediated cancers and so on. And at the same time, biomonitoring delivers uh, evidence of human humans being exposed to a wide variety of chemicals, many of them being also food contact chemicals like bisphenols or phthalates or nonylphenols and so on. And so the question is whether and how exposure to all these different chemicals is contributing to the chronic disease in the human population. And what is also important to realize that there could actually be many more hazardous chemicals that people are exposed to, which are crucial to the exposures and to the disease occurrence that we don't know yet. So why there is so much attention currently dedicated to plastic food packaging in particular among all the different food contact materials? Well, first of all, uh, plastics, uh, plastic food packaging covers a very high share in global plastics production and also among different food contact materials. And this of course leads to very high exposure potential for humans and the environment. At the same time, plastics are known to be linked with several hazardous chemicals, and there is high diversity of chemicals with many unknowns in the plastics. And last but not least, there are concerns that recycling could compromise chemical safety. So um, I will go actually through all these um, aspects in my next slides in a bit more detail. So global plastic production has risen from 1950s, of which Steve was uh, reminding us about, to, uh, to very high levels. For example, in 2015, global plastics production was 380 million metric tons. And of this, uh, actually 40% are used for packaging applications. And among these packaging applications, actually a quarter of global, of global plastics production is used, is used for food and beverage plastic packaging. And also among different food packaging materials, Plastics, flexible and rigid, actually constitute more than half of, of different food packaging materials. And so you can see different articles here. But also what is important to realize that also many other food contact articles, like for example, uh, metal cans or beverage cartons, they also have a, a layer of plastics uh, constitu constituted inside them, like for example, epoxy-based coatings in, in the metal cans, or the plastic layer in the tetra packs and so on. So actually we can safely say that the majority of materials which are in direct contact with food are currently constituted of plastics. And all this direct contact with food is of course bearing a half potential for human exposure if there would be any chemicals migrating into food, but also all this uh, plastic packaging actually can and does contribute to environmental pollution, of which you of course have heard and seen. And it has been shown that uh, around in marine litter, uh, around 49% is constituted by single use plastics. And among these single use plastics items, actually the majority is used either for food packaging or for food cons consumption applications. And what is important is that when we think about plastics in the environment or in contact with human food, we, especially for the environment, we have to think that there is not only aspects of persistence and of physical hazards which are coming together with plastics, but also plastics are a source of chemicals. So let's look at the chemical composition of plastics. So the intentionally added substances uh, are uh, consisting, consisting of you monomers, monomers to make, uh, to make uh, uh, plastic polymers. And they also uh, include additives, which are used, used to impart different functions, like for example, stabilizers, plasticizers, or colorants. But there are also processing aids like solvents, which are used during plastics production and can be present in the final polymer as residues. So if you look at the final compounded plastic material, actually uh, what it, it looks something like this. So you see the monomers are forming the polymer chains and you see different additives and residues of production aids here or there. But what you can also hopefully see is that there are actually many more chemicals in the final compounded plastics, which we haven't added before. And these are the so-called non-intentionally added substances, which can include impurities and contaminants. They can include linear or cyclic oligomers, but also many other substances like reaction byproducts, breakdown products, neoformed products, which are actually incompletely characterized and their toxicity is incompletely understood to, to now. 
And if you want more details about non-intentionally added substances, my colleague Birgit Goike has just published a second edition of her dossier on NICE, which you can download at the FPF website. But if you think about material constitutes of plastic packaging, it is also important to realize that uh, plastic items of packaging can consist of plastic polymers, which can be coming single or in combination, like for example, the body and the lid of the plastic bottle are made of different polymers. But there are also other components, uh, such as printing inks, adhesive foils or coatings, which are used in more sophisticated plastic packaging design. And these components are often very difficult to separate, which means, for example, if you want to recycle it, you would have to recycle it together. So all of this have to be considered as um, integral components of plastic packaging, also bringing along all of the diverse chemicals which are constituting these materials as well. So what are the hazardous chemicals in, in food packaging plastics? Of course, there are many familiar names like bisphenol, phthalates, brominated flame retardants, and so on. But also, there are likely many more chemicals which we do not know yet. For example, this recent publication by Christina Nerin has highlighted a common surfactant used in food packaging, which, can be, uh, which is found to be toxic for reproduction in mammals. So realizing that there, are, there is such a diversity of chemicals in plastic packaging, which is not completely understood and not completely characterized, we have initiated this uh, project, Hazardous Chemicals in Plastic Packaging, State of the Art Prioritization and Assessment. We call it an HCPP project. It involves several partners from academia and NGO fields. And the deliverables of this project were a database of chemicals associated with plastic packaging which is now published, but also the hazard assessment and prioritization case studies, which were now published as well. And the evaluation of substitution candidates is currently ongoing. And when we now look at this database, it's important to realize that it has been covering both food and non-food applications. So that's a disclaimer. And uh, the data sources which we used uh, to compile the database of chemicals associated with plastic packaging, unfortunately, we as, uh, we as people who are only relying on published information are not able to come up with something really new, as Steve was promising. But what we did was to compile different data from many different sources available in different places. And kind of we tried to bring it all together to, to allow a better overview. So that's the value of this database. Not that it actually gives you any new information that nobody has known and we found somewhere. Uh, and we also, to assess the hazards of chemicals which are included in this database, we relied on the hazard classifications aligned with the globally harmonized system for classification and labeling of chemicals. And we also considered classifications for persistency and endocrine disruption. So uh, the current database version can be downloaded at, downloaded at the links that you can see on this page. It currently includes 4,255 chemicals, which are further divided in list R with 902 chemicals, which are likely associated with plastic packaging, and list B with 3,353 chemicals, which are possibly associated with plastic packaging. And the reason we had to do this division is because we had insufficiently, insufficient transparency and lack of information on the actual use of chemicals specifically in plastic packaging that we were faced with. So we can only uh, think that we, we have only had indications for likely association for 900 chemicals, but for the others we had association of possible uh, occurrence in plastic packaging. And when we looked at the hazardous chemicals associated with plastic packaging, we focused only on the list R of chemicals likely associated. And we tried to use the most conservative sources on the hazard data, which I agreed by, on by multiple stakeholders. So for example, the harmonized hazard data uh, based on GHS. But we had this data only for 13% of chemicals uh, on list R for environmental hazards and 27% of chemicals on human health hazards. So we could only actually uh, assess these chemicals for which the information was available and all others remain uncharacterized in these terms. We have also considered uh, conservative sources for identification of endocrine disrupting chemicals and persistent hazardous chemicals. And with these conservative sources, we actually uh, compiled the list of top hazardous chemicals likely associated with plastic packaging, which includes with overlaps around 148 uh, uh, chemicals. So 63 hazardous to human health, 68 hazardous to the environment, 35 endocrine disrupting chemicals, and seven persistent bioaccumulative and toxic or very persistent, very bioaccumulative chemicals. And the case studies, which we performed to further narrow down this list, have actually prioritized five phthalates as the most urgent substitution candidates, which are currently now being evaluated by the project partners.
And phthalates are used as plasticizers in plastics, but uh, actually the 148 uh, hazardous chemicals uh, we have identified are used for a variety of different functions in plastics, which you can see here on this uh, frequency map, or you can also look for more details in the publications which are freely available online. But what about food contact chemicals among CPPDB chemicals? As you remember, CPPDB was covering both food and non-food plastics, but is, as you can see on this slide, there's actually, actually the majority of uh, top hazardous chemicals associated with plastic packaging actually have indications of food, food contact use as well. So it's not that non-food packaging is actually much more hazardous than, uh, or, or has much more hazardous chemicals than the food, pa uh, food packaging itself. And what I would also like to emphasize again is, is the lack of harmonized hazard data for many CPPDB chemicals. So I have already said that we had uh, the harmonized data for really uh, a minority of the chemicals in the database. And if you use less conservative hazard data sources, like for example, for example advisory classifications by the Danish uh, Environmental Protection Agency, which were done based on the in silico modeling, uh, you get here around 100 chemicals more on the top hazardous list of which um, the majority is also used in food contact. So many chemicals lacking harmonized hazard data could, could actually be hazardous as well and it still remains to be characterized and understood what it means. So we already come to the first conclusions of my talk. We have seen that there are numerous hazardous chemicals used or allowed for use in plastic food packaging and the assignment of harmonized hazard classifications often lags behind the current scientific understanding. And this extreme complexity actually hinders comprehensive overview and risk assessment, especially with regard to mixture toxicity. And also non-intentionally added substances pose unique challenges for systematic identification, toxicity testing, and risk assessment of plastics. And in the last part of my talk, I would just briefly mention the chemical safety aspects of plastics recycling. So we have published a paper where we looked at the chemical safety aspects for commonly used food packaging materials. And it is, uh, uh, it is uh, agreed in the field that metals and glass are permanent materials with theoretically unlimited recycling, while plastic and paper are actually classified as non-permanent materials that actually degrade during mechanical recycling. And thus, at every recycling round, you would require addition of virgin material, like of a certain proportion of virgin material. But also knowing that the plastics degrades during recycling, that also bring, brings in more chemical complexity, both in terms of degrading polymers, but also degrading additives and so on. And in the US and Europe, uh, their respective authorities actually evaluate the safety of mechanical recycling processes for plastic FCMs. And you can see on this slide that actually the most uh, so far approved recycling processes are for PET bottles, so the drink bottles, and some of them also for HDPE bottles like meal bottles, and much less recycling processes have been approved for polystyrene plastics or for all the other plastics which actually still constitute the majority of plastic packaging. So we can say that the majority of plastic packaging is currently still not having any recycling possibilities at the moment. And recycled plastics uh, suffer from many uh, contaminants issues which are summarized in this slide and I will not go through this in detail now but I would just like to say that, that with all the challenges ahead there are still many more efforts and investments needed to ensure that recycling does not compromise FCM safety. And the European Commission has also recognized this and will be publishing soon a report on research and innovation for circular economy of plastics, which is actually looking at the perspective of plastics recycling and safety uh, from many different angles. And I would like to finish off by reflecting on what are the alternatives to single plastics at the moment. So it is important to to realize that we should not blindly constitute with other materials, but we should properly consider functional performance, energy and resource efficiency, recyclability and chemical safety aspects as well. Like for example, you cannot substitute plastics with paper one-to-one -one because paper, also recycled paper, has its own chemical safety issues like mineral oils, fluorochemicals and so on. So actually we should see this current move to realization that the business as usual with using a lot of single-use plastics and food packaging cannot continue uh, as uh, cannot just continue like this we should see this as an opportunity to, to develop better and safer FCMs and FCAs and actually to try to improve FCM regulation and management frameworks as a whole 
And this has been discussed, for example, in a paper published by the FPF and its scientific advisory board, which you can read in environmental health perspectives. And uh, FPF has realized that actually, uh, as I have shown, apart from plastics, there are many more food contact materials which may require our attention. So there is currently an ongoing project, Food Contact Chemicals and Human Health, which aims to systematically map data on FCC's contribution to human exposure and potential health effects. And there will be a translational, translational. science event uh, for the FCC and HH project uh, in June next year. And the further information about this project will be posted soon on the FPF website, which you're welcome to visit. And it's anyway uh, worth visiting FPF website because we have a lot of content, lot of there, content there, including the recordings, including the recordings that you can, that you can, uh, uh, you can uh, freely you can view, freely uh, view uh, and freely access, freely access at any time. Any time. And I'd like just to Netflix finish just off, to finish by, off by, by thanking MAB Foundation, Foundation for the funding provided for the project, for the project. and also all the and different all people the different involved in this project, some of them you come up here on this photo, and I thank you and for I your you for Thank you very much, Dr. Gro. Great. Um, so it's my privilege to begin this presentation, which I'll be jointly sharing with Rachel Schaefer, who is a key author on our food additives and child health po technical report policy statement that was recently published by the American Academy of Pediatrics in its home journal, Pediatrics. And it builds nicely off what Xenia described as the health concerns that are increasingly being raised by uh, food contact services. Uh, we'll go to the next slide. Um, I'm going to take a couple of moments just to provide some context as uh, one of the members of the American Academy of Pediatrics who wrote this statement so that you understand what the role of the AAP is and what its history is. So it's an organization of 60,000 pediatricians uh, across all swaths ranging from generalists to specialists um, as well as uh, liberal to conservative. Um, as as, uh, that, and that's important to emphasize given uh, the, the groundbreakingness and, and willingness to push the envelope on behalf of scientific knowledge and behalf of children's health. So this is, um, as we described in some of the media presentations of these findings, this is not a, a green or lefty organization uh, presenting this. This is uh, something that really should be treated as a mainstream public health issue. Um, which I think just adds to the ongoing work that we all have to do on this front. Um, specifically within the academy, uh, there are many committees and councils and the council that took on the leadership in, in putting together this report is the Council on Environmental Health, uh, which as you can see is the list of members interested in and concerned about children's environmental health and toxic exposure. So we'll go on to the next slide. Um, so this provides some uh, of the activities of the council, and this is where I have the opportunity to emphasize one of the major ways that uh, the academy can step forward on public health issues of the day that affect kids is by writing first a policy statement and technical report with a technical report providing the scientific foundation and then the policy statement making, con making concrete suggestions that its government affairs offices and other leaders, leaders can take forward. It's a way to get the entire academy on the same page. And that really uh, speaks to the numerous levels of review that these policy statements and technical reports can take place, including a very vigorous uh, presence uh, by legal and regulatory affairs. So once a document like this gets through, and it took two years in this case to get it through, um, it really has been through the proverbial ringer and speaks to the rigorousness and then the broad use of these kinds of documents. And as you can see, the Academy also plays a key role in a variety of educational initiatives, most prominently uh, the landmark Pediatric Environmental Health Manual, which is in its third edition. And so with that, I'm going to pass the baton to Rachel, who will uh, take the lead in presenting the content uh, in the policy statement and technical report. Rachel? Thanks, Leo. Can you hear me? Okay, great. So as Leo mentioned, uh, the technical report and policy statement on food additives and child health um, were both published in July of 2018, and I'll walk you through the content of those documents. 
Before diving in, it's important that we're on the same page about what we're talking about. What is a food additive? This has a specific legal definition. A food additive is a substance in the intended use of which results or may reasonably be expected to result directly or indirectly in becoming a component or otherwise affecting the characteristics of any food. So these can be direct or indirect food additives. A direct food additive is something that's intentionally added to food, like a coloring, a flavoring, or a preservative. And indirect food additives are not directly or intentionally added to food, but are expected to become part of food through the packaging, processing, or manufacturing of the food product. So the technical report reviewed the evidence of harm to child health from food additives, and we looked at epidemiological and toxicological data and also exposure data and trends on both direct and indirect food additives that I just introduced on the previous slide. There was a particular focus on endocrine disruptors for this report. Endocrine disruptors interfere with hormonal signaling, which is particularly concerning for child health. This is a report from the American Academy of Pediatrics with a focus on child health. And the endocrine system is crucial for the development and it regulates key developmental processes early in life, the disruption of which could have lifelong consequences. And there's growing consensus and concern about endocrine disrupting chemicals. This is a statement from the Endocrine Society in 2009. And the World Health Organization published their state of the science on endocrine disrupting chemicals in 2012. So given this um, concern, there was a particular focus on this as we were reviewing the data on chemicals and child health. So I'll start with reviewing the indirect food additives that we covered in the technical report. The first category was bisphenols, which include bisphenol A, BPA, but also a lot of related compounds that are increasingly being used as substitutes as manufacturers are removing BPA from their products. Bisphenols are used in polycarbonate plastic containers and also as re resins for food and beverage cans. There's concern for bisphenols for their potential for to be endocrine disruptors, their obesogenic activity and metabolic disruption, and also a concern about neurodevelopmental disruption. Another key chemical class that we highlight are phthalates. Phthalates uh, are used in numerous plastic related uses in food packaging and food additives. Um, they're used as clear in clear plastic food wrap, they're used in plastic tubing and storage containers, and also in food manufacturing equipment. They've also been linked to endocrine disruption, obesogenic activity, metabolic disruption, and oxidative stress, as well as cardiotoxicity. Next, we highlight growing evidence around perfluoroalkyl chemicals, or PFCs. PFCs have been the focus of a lot of attention recently because they're extremely persistent in our bodies. They're used in food-related uses as greaseproof paper and paperboard. So for example, um, pizza boxes or popcorn bag liners, anything that's holding potentially greasy food, um, you'll find PFCs there. Um, and PFCs have been linked to immunosuppression, endocrine disruption, and also obesogenic activity. And finally, we highlight concerns around perchlorate, which is used as an antistatic agent in food packaging and can also enter the food supply as a contaminant from food manufacturing cleaning products. And perchlorate is a known thyroid hormone disruptor. Next, moving on to the direct food additives that we cover in the report, we highlight concerns around nitrates and nitrites, which are used as preservatives and color enhancers, especially in meats and they've been linked to carcinogenicity and also um, thyroid hormone disruption. And finally, we highlight concerns around artificial food colors, which as their name implies, are used as coloring um, for aesthetic purposes. And there's a, perhaps a least well-developed evidence, but still um, we felt like it was important to highlight concerns around potential effects on neurobehavioral outcomes, such as exacerbation of attention deficit and hyperactivity disorder. That's a very brief overview of the technical report. Uh, we can answer questions in Q&A. I also encourage you to take a look at the report online. Now I want to move on to the policy statement, the goals of which were to review the regulatory system for food additives, to provide guidance to pediatricians about this issue, and also propose reform to the current regulatory process. 
So again, I want to set the stage before moving on to the content to what is the framework for regulating food additives in this country. In 1938, the Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act was passed, and this gave authority to the US FDA to oversee the safety of food and other devices and products. Um, in 1958, the Federal um, the, the Food Additive Amendment was passed, and this established a specific regulatory program for food additives. It also established this legal definition of food additives that I shared with you earlier, and it established an exemption for substances that are generally recognized as safe or grass, which we'll come back to in a few minutes. Um, in 1997, there is an approval process created for food contact substances under the Food and Drug Modernization Act. I'm not going to go into detail on that, but I want to put that up just for context. So given this framework, the question is, does this current regulatory system ensure food safety? Unfortunately, no. We and others have concluded that the current system is not adequately protective of and does not provide sufficient review of food additives. Tom Neltner and colleagues in 2013, for example, reviewed data on almost 4,000 direct food additives. They found that over 60% had no oral toxicology data and over 90% had no reproductive toxicology data. So what are the reasons for these shortcomings, which are very concerning? First is there's extensive use and overuse of this GRASS designation. And two, there are inherent limitations to FDA's authority and procedures that prevent sufficient review of food additives. I'll go through each of those in turn now. So the generally recognized as safe designation is defined for substances that are generally recognized among experts who are qualified to make those decisions as being safe under their conditions of intended use. This designation was designed to be applied in a very limited way for specific chemicals that really did not need a full, the full resources of an extensive safety review, such as oils or vinegars. This designation has now been used in a very widespread manner to almost a thousand chemicals. And the problem is that once a substance is designated as grass, there's no opportunity or legal obligation for FDA or public review. And what's even more concerning is that these grass designations can be made by manufacturers or consultants paid by those manufacturers. So there's extensive conflict of interest. And then once that grass designation is made, there's no opportunity for transparency or in-depth review of those products. The other key concerns that we highlight are related to limitations to FDA authority and procedure that prevent this full thorough safety review of food additives. So for example, FDA does not have authority to obtain data or reassess the safety of chemicals that are already on the market. This is very problematic, for example, for chemicals that were approved decades ago with perhaps outdated testing methods but there's no opportunity to require more data with newer methods today. There's no consideration of cumulative or synergistic effects of chemicals, which is concerning given that we're exposed to a variety of compounds every day from a variety of sources. There are also outdated toxicity testing recommendations, which we highlight might not be sufficiently protective for children. For example, the FDA testing guidelines are based on estimated daily exposures only without consideration of body weight. And children with their low body weight and relatively high food and water intake might be exposed um, at a relatively higher burden compared to adults. And second, there are limited or sometimes even no requirements for neurobehavioral or endocrine endpoint testing. And again, this is very concerning given the focus on child health and the potential for neurobehavioral or endocrine disruption at very low levels of exposure. So now I'm gonna pass it back to Leo to talk about what our recommendations are for how to make improvements. Thanks, Rachel. That really covers the, the scientific issues very nicely. Um, so there are safe and simple steps to reduce exposure to um, chemicals commonly found in food packaging that are known to be of concern. 
Um, the academy statement being what it is, there's a, a balancing act that we always have to take with regard to what we communicate um, that are relevant to low income and other populations in whom resources might be limited to carry out all of these recommendations. But um, the emphasis on the statement uh, was to advise uh, families not to microwave plastic uh, containers, avoid putting plastics in the dishwasher, being mindful of the recycling numbers on plastic uh, containers, avoiding three, six, and seven in particular, encouraging uh, hand washing before handling foods, um, as well as avoiding processed meats, especially during pregnancy. We'll go on to the next slide. Um, this, uh, these recommendations were grounded in studies that this group may well be familiar with, in particular the findings of Ruth Ann Rudell and her colleagues at Silent Spring that documented through a uh, intervention reductions, uh, that is a fresh food intervention, reductions in BPA and the DEHP levels by between 53 and 66 percent. We can go on to the next slide. Um, in general, though, the Academy emphasized not only the need for safe and simple steps to be taken, but substantial changes in regulatory policy. Not all of it has to be done through legislation. The FDA in particular could take administrative actions uh, through its food authority under FDUCA, the Federal Food and Drug and Cosmetic Act, revising the grass process, um, coordinating with other agencies such as NIEHS and EPA to address the existing data gaps, look carefully at uh, toxicity testing guidelines, including incorporating appropriate methods for better endocrine disruption testing, uh, examination of synergistic and cumulative effects, and establishing requirements for labeling of food additives when data are not available to confirm safety. Uh, in addition, um, Congress could provide FDA with authority to collect additional information, uh, provide dedicated resources to support an enhanced agency activity in more in line with what's on the drug side of the operation and supporting provisions to ensure uh, transparency and avoid COI. I'll go to the next slide. Um, so I'll just close with some examples that we referred to in as support of the potential economic benefits uh, associated with preventing exposure to common food additives. So uh, it's well known that FDA banned BPA from baby bottles and sippy cups, but chose not to limit uh, other food uses. We'll go on to the next slide. Um, and we did a study back in 2014 looking at two of the many outcomes associated with BPA exposure. Arguably, the evidence at this point is even stronger for ovarian dysfunction than the ones selected here at the time. Uh, but even for those two, uh, the health costs associated with BPA exposure were found to be on the order of $3 billion. We'll go on the next slide. And in a counterfactual scenario, we found that replacement of BPA with a substitute uh, free of health effects, potentially, but not definitively, such as oleoresin, could cost on the order 2.2 cents per can. If there are 100 billion cans produced annually, that means a cost to society of $2.2 billion. And then in the counterfactual scenario where we reduced BPA levels based upon the available data for intervention studies, you can see here an economic benefit on the order of $1.7 billion, which nearly matches um, the costs associated with oleoresin as one alternative. And in sensitivity analyses where we modeled various sensitive inputs, we actually found potential benefits that were actually sixfold greater than the associated costs uh, identified. We'll go on to the next slide. Um, the reality, however, is that BPA has not been replaced by oleoresin. What little we know about one of the regrettable substitutes, in this case BPS, is it's as estrogenic, it's as persistent, if not more, in the environment, and it is equally toxic, if not more, to embryos. Uh, so the reality is we are not treading in the right direction to uh, obtain the economic benefits that are potentially there. Uh, we'll go on to the next slide. Um, and this slide just emphasizes the broader reality and the substantial contribution of food additive chemicals to the disease burden and disability uh, that are known to be due to endocrine disrupting chemicals. This slide prevents, presents the European data. Clearly pesticides in Europe drive the most substantial contribution that you can see on the right side of that picture that phthalates and bisphenols actually do provide a substantial contribution to the overall 
uh, burden of disease based on what little we know about endocrine disrupting chemicals and their effect on human health. And that's based on knowledge of less than 5% of the EDCs, a subset of costs associated with the diseases due to those EDCs and a subset of diseases themselves due to EDCs. So this is a very conservative estimate as Kazeni also explained. The reality is that for many of these chemicals, we don't even know if they're used in food packaging, let alone the health effects of what we is definitively used in food packaging. So what little we know suggests already substantial cause for concern. In the United States, on the next slide, you can see a equally substantial, if not greater, contribution on the order of $56 billion in costs of, of food packaging materials, phthalates and bisphenols to the overall contribution of the $340 billion that we identified in disease costs due to endocrine disrupting chemicals in the United States alone. And again, that's an annual cost insofar as exposures con continue at current levels. So with that, I believe that's our last slide. We, I have many people to thank. Our other co-author, Sheila Satyana Rayana, uh, was especially gracious in supporting this project as were the other members of the Council on the Environmental Health Executive Committee. There are some former executive committee members who also deserve our thanks, as well as liaisons. Uh, the AAP benefits from input from NIEHS, EPA, ACOG, and CDC, uh, as well as NCI. And Paul Spire was crucial in making sure that we got through uh, this complex maze that is the Academy for this important work. Thank you. I like to do it right after the presentations is ask, now two of you know each other very well, but do you have any, has anything come up from listening to these that you'd like to ask each other or comment on each other's presentations briefly? I'm getting no, no response here. Hello, Leo? Uh, we, we, we can hear your question. Hear your okay. question. I, Nothing else. Okay, well, that's okay. Well, I, I have a question for you then in particular. I'm, I'm a longtime veteran of uh, doing policy statements, particularly in environmental health for medical associations, uh, all the way up to the AMA, et cetera. And so I'm wondering, and I commend you very much for this, and the AAP uh, pediatrics is, of course, very relevant given the developmental effects of many of the chemicals that we talk about. And I'm wondering, you know, you've only had the report released for a few months now, but what has been any response from within the association? Um, so thank you. That's a great question. So the response has been quite positive um, from within the academy. Um, there were um, many media representatives uh, who presented this work uh, that were actually academy members who didn't serve on the executive committee or were not as closely involved in the report. The communication uh, has been strong, if not perfectly consistent. And I've gotten very little, it, I can't think of a single pediatrician who's offered me any negative feedback or concern about the statement, nor have my authors. Um, there's an interesting story of, of what the industry uh, tried to do, but that, that might be for a later day. Actually would like to hear that briefly, if you could. <laughs> um, I'm not going to give the full details because I'd like to save it for a later day, but uh, suffice it to say, th they tried to make a response and tried to argue that they were free of conflict of interest, and the Academy decided that that would not be an appropriate uh, way to follow the rules. So uh, the, their comment was actually withdrawn because they could not follow COI rules. They actually did, they actually not, did want not want to want to communicate, communicate a conflict. Uh, we have a couple of questions uh, online. Uh, one of them just uh, for for Dr. Gro is your database part of the Data Commons? Um, thank um, you for this question. For this question. As, I As I understand, you mean the Chemical Hazards Data Commons, which is maintained by the Healthy Buildings Network. I hope I'm, I'm right in assuming this. So. The list R of the database has been uploaded to Data Commons to facilitate information exchange between uh, interested uh, people. So yes, the list R is there. List B, which is for possibly associated chemicals, we could not upload, both for the reasons of uh, uncertainty in their use, but also because it's just a very big list to handle in that database. Uh, thank you. We have another question is uh, to anybody, I guess. Can you explain what an antistatic agent is in food packaging? 
an anti-static agent is something that is added to remove the static that could uh, accumulate in the packaging during, during um, transfer of that food. Thank you. Uh, we have one that's a consumer question uh, about food. Kale, Swiss chard, and arugula are three of the foods with highest nitrate content. Mother's milk also contains nitrate. What is it about added nitrates that is different? Um, Leo, do you want to take this or I can start? Um, my, my understanding Why don't you start? Is that, yeah, my understanding is that um, foods that have naturally occurring nitrates also have vitamin C and other related compounds that, um, so, so first let me start. The main concern with nitrates and nitrites is that they're converted to nitrosamines. Um, and so uh, naturally occurring nitrates are often also um, accompanied by vitamin C and compounds that inhibit that conversion to nitrosamine. So there's less concern uh, with those natural nitrates. Um, I'll just um, add, I'll just that, add that, um, so it's true that there are naturally derived compounds that can potentially introduce complexity in how we communicate the, the knowledge about these um, exposures and their effects. Um, but at the same time, as Rachel indicated, in many cases, the, the exposures themselves are mitigated by other, other factors or compared to the synthetic chemical version uh, that's used, the effects are more modest. As I have to say, you can completely exclude it, but at the same time, um, there are other sources of these exposures that we really should focus on I, 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 in terms of prevention um, that will come from potentially regulatory or other activities. Um, in some cases, it may not be possible to eliminate them altogether, as long as we're transparent about what can and can't be limited and some of the trade-offs involved, I think we're on a a, a pretty strong footing. I, 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 we've we've published ourselves on some of the effects of thiocyanates, nitrates, and and on thyroid function, for example, and have found some of the same concerns that that you raised. There are there are effects of of these of naturally derived compounds that can exist in um, certain fruits and vegetables, but that doesn't take away from the benefits associated with fruits and vegetables. Thank you. Uh, question is. Uh, can the speakers comment on the potential health effects of microplastic pollution that has, has been widely covered in the media recently? Xenia, I'll start. Maybe then I'll pass it to you. How's that sound? Okay, great. So um, there's a lot we don't know um, here. Um, this is clearly an emerging issue. There are the effects of, of the chemicals in the microplastic itself, the microplastic material, and then there are potential for uh, the one of our colleagues, Thomas Bachhaus, doesn't uh, feel that this is a major concern. Um, there are carry-on chemical compounds from these microplastics, that is uh, chemicals that hitch a ride on the, on the microplastic beads themselves that could be problematic as well. Um, at, at this point, um, in our report, we focus on what is best known with the idea that we can progress our knowledge and then provide some guidance for action. It's not to minimize uh, the real concerns ecologically uh, with microplastics, um, as well as the potential implications for human health. But right now, there, there really are no studies on which to ground uh, a careful evaluation of the human health effects. Ksenia, feel free to jump in. Yeah, thank you, Leo. Uh, I think you've essentially covered it, that uh, there are many unknowns in the health, potential health effects of microplastic pollution at the moment. So just a few things to mention. So it is, it is, it has been estimated that at the current levels and for the effects which are regularly looked at, uh, the current uh, levels of microplastic pollution do not seem to, to, to represent a, a risk for human health. However, there are aspects to this. So first of all, uh, key word is the current levels and if uh, the use of plastics con con continues as it is now, the current levels are likely to increase because this is a persistent pollutant. 
Another thing is that when you look at the health effects of microplastics, there are certain effects which maybe do not receive a proper consideration at the moment. So for example, people think about acute toxicity or any other effects, but for example, there, are, there have been demonstrated effects on the gut microbiota in the human guts, and this is now uh, being considered an emerging player in the health of humans, and there is not enough understood about how microbiota affects human health, but there is understanding that it is involved in there, and there are possibilities that it could be, for example, affected by microplastics, but this is again not completely known at the moment. And there is also a question about actually measuring microplastics exposures, because at the moment there are uh, not enough uh, high throughput and sensitive methods to actually measure it easily and quickly. So all the data that we have is based on the very, uh, is, is somehow still patchy and uh, you can only measure particles down to around one micrometer and with, with great difficulties. But actually there is a possibility that there could be many more smaller particles which are there but just remain unmeasured at the moment. So that's the unknowns. Great, thank you. And sorry to jump in, but I just wanted to mention that our next webinar um, in this series is going to focus on microplastics and that will be held on January 30th. So we encourage everyone to sign up and attend. Thank you. Question again, food colorings have been controversial for many years. You included them among chemicals of concern and have you received much pushback on them specifically? Um, I'll start, um, yes. There, there are, we actually had to be extremely careful in our wording because the science is simply extremely limited. Um, this is a combination problem where we're confounded by the lack of disclosure around the, the components of these food colorings because of trade secrets. And at the same time, they're not well studied because it's not known how much uh, are in many formulations. So the reality is what little we know is based on a few studies that have suggested potential implications for symptoms in kids with ADHD. And the, it, it, you know, there's been a rumble of people whining that we even mentioned the studies themselves, but I think we did a terrific job of taking great care to say how uh, they're single studies, they're speculative, they're cross-sectional, and that they're limited and to emphasize the fact that that doesn't mean that we have definitive information nor does it mean that we should simply stop and sh throw up our hands. Um, it really is an area of need for further research uh, to the betterment uh, so that we know if they're bad or not, period. Um, so this is clearly an area of gray, but I think we really can pat ourselves on the back by how we handled it in the report. Thank you. Here's a question. Are flame retardants used in food uh, pa pla packaging plastics? Which ones and are they intentionally used or contaminants from recycling? Yeah, so I think I can take that one on. So uh, the question was if flame retardants are used in food contact plastics. So what we know about food packaging plastics, they are not used there intentionally. However, there have been uh, quite a lot of data and studies from many different uh, groups and authorities demonstrating the presence of particularly brominated flame retardants in food contact plastics. Uh, in both Europe and, and uh, also in, in, in other countries across the globe. And the current understanding is that this happens from uh, contamination from the waste electronics and, and uh, electric uh, uh, equipment uh, because of insufficient uh, sorting uh, or contamination during the collection of uh, waste streams for recycling. And this is actually a, a matter of great concern because uh, the, the contamination has really been demonstrated. So actually with a safe bet, uh, the plastics, the black plastics could be containing brominated flame retardants as uh, just one of the um, materials which are possible there. With regards to food contact plastics, actually for other food contact equipment, we actually do not know if uh, flame retardants are actually used, for example, at the processing plant equipment or so on. There, we could not find any information about that. Thank you for that. We are coming up on the end of the hour and we have a couple of questions here that are related to policy issues such as TSCA, the chemical prioritization and so forth. But what I think I'd like to do since we're right up at the end, if, if any of the three speakers would like to just make a concluding remark on what your 
ideal, what you would like to come out of this, uh, these new reports and processes, and then we will conclude. Okay, so maybe I can uh, just start. So uh, when when we tried to so when we tried to comply the database, which I have been presented presenting, we were uh, we were very much struck by the uh, patchiness and incompleteness of information which is available in the public domain. So the talk is always about that the transparency is there, but actually the actual access to information is very much restricted and difficult for anyone who actually wants to get it. So we would have we would wish us uh, more more clarity and more cooperation on the part of industry to also say which compounds are used, which have been abundant for use, and so on, that this information is more clear on the, on the public access. Um, so I'll just add that our report really, um, I think has provided a substantial framework for putting uh, a key medical audience at the table for policymakers to really listen to and engage on a, a prominent and emerging environmental health threat. So I think while we clearly need substantial research to continue our, uh, and improve our understanding of these chemicals, um, and we need uh, regulation that perhaps may not be feasible, at least in the United States in the current political climate, I think it'll not only set the foundation for policy change when the climate is more temperate, um, it also uh, sets the stage for broader public dialogue on this issue and more proactive action and ultimately consumers driving better practices through uh, market share. Thank you for that. So uh, I want to thank all three of you, particularly for your great work, but also for your great presentations and discussion today. Uh, clearly, there's a lot of uh, both cause for concern and some movement now, and it's some of that is thanks to you. So. And to everybody who called in or listened in, uh, thank you very much for joining us. And then, as noted, there will be more calls along here. And I will now turn it back to Maria to sign us off. So have a great day, everybody. Great. Thank you so much, Steve. We are approaching the end of today's webinar. A video recording will be available on the CHE website soon. And tomorrow, you will receive an email containing a link to the video. CHE's next webinar from the CHE EDC Strategies Partnership will take place Thursday, December 13th, and will feature new research on phthalates and language development. Details will be available on our website later today. CHE's next webinar from today's series, The Effects of Plastics on Health, will take place Wednesday, January 30th, and is titled Microplastics, an Emerging Threat to Global Ecology and Public Health. To learn more and to RSVP, please visit our website at healthandenvironment.org. If you are new to CHE and would like to stay updated about upcoming events and more, please sign up to receive our newsletter by selecting the Join Us tab at the top of any page on our website. Additionally, if you appreciate these CHE partnership webinars bringing you the latest in environmental health research for free, we encourage you to support CHE's ongoing work by making a tax-deductible donation via our secure website. Again, our website is healthandenvironment.org. With that, I would like to thank our speakers for taking the time to present today and Steve for his excellent moderation. Thank you so much for joining us and have a great day.